What's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of On The Mic with Michael Flix. Very, very happy to be back. I know I've been taking a lot of breaks, but uh, believe me, it's for good reason. Got a very, very special guest for you guys, man. Very, uh, it's like you like uh, like San Diego alumni, the first family of baseball in San Diego. <laughs> I'm, gonna that you're talking, man. I'm very excited to have you here, man. Tony Gwynn Jr., I appreciate you joining me on the show today. Man. Mike, I appreciate you having me, brother. Absolutely, man. Everything good with you? How you been doing? I've been well, man. Just enjoying the, well, the little bit of off-season I have left and... Uh, Getting a chance to spend some time with the family and watch the kids do, you know, do 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 their thing a little bit. I hear you. I hear you, man. What's uh, family life? How's how, how's everything going with that? You were just talking about you got a, a daughter that's playing uh, high school soccer right now. Yeah, uh, I have three daughters. I have four children. I have three daughters. Uh, my oldest, Michaela, is uh, playing for Mount Carmel, and uh, she's on the varsity team. They're having a terrific season. Um, and just getting a chance to, to watch her and my middle my middle daughter Jordan and my youngest lady my son is he's eight years old and he's he's in everything we're gonna let him explore the sports world a little bit but uh, it's this is this is a fun time of year for me absolutely absolutely I got an eight year old son myself I've been um been uh, fit, trying to figure out what sport he's gonna play he he loves to run so may, I'm thinking maybe soccer yeah, yeah but yeah, uh, yeah. and he he loves basketball as well so we we'll see we'll see but he is at eight you know you can exactly. you can you could you could try a whole bunch of different things yeah. it don't matter exactly. at this point <laughs> exactly exactly speaking of that when at, how old were you when you, I mean obviously your dad being you know a big baseball star how old were you when you st- first started playing I mean I was probably like every other kid when when t ball rolled around I think that's about what six seven um Probably was my first experience playing. Um, I, I kind of was one of those kids that, you know, I think I think at that time, all the kids were really like, whatever time of year it was, that was the sport you were playing. So um, I probably started at that young, six, seven years years of age playing playing baseball. Mm-hmm. Was it only baseball? You were saying like you play whatever sport? Yeah. No. I mean, it was it was just it was just so different, right? I mean, I could go back to see my grandmother and in the neighborhood you know they would they would be throwing the football around so we play street football and right. then you know we, we do that for a little bit and somebody had a hoop in their backyard you, you go do that now in terms of organized sports I didn't play a ton of organized sports outside of baseball you know little league was you know what it was so that's what I did there was no travel ball really at that at that age mm-hmm. Um, I played in my local what PYBL basketball league when I was young, but outside of those two sports, I don't know that I was really playing organized sports. A lot of my experience came from being in the backyard with my cousins or, or my uncles. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I uh, it's funny. I was just talking to my my brother. I think my mom as well about this. I I never thought about like as a kid how like you said we're outside playing football and just doing things outside. Yeah. I never thought about like how any sport I went into, I just needed to learn the footwork and like a little bit of mechanics. But like athletically and being able to like run and jump and compete with anyone my age or even kids older, that was always no problem because we was always outside doing something, right. playing football, climbing trees. You wouldn't even think about it most of the time, right? You, whatever was outside that was, you know, entertaining at the time, that's what we did. And so sometimes that was, you know, playing strikeout in the backyard or sometimes that was, you know, two-hand touch in the street. Cars are cars are in play. You're gonna have to watch out for those <laughs> that are parked on the sidewalk. Um, we'd race. I mean, there was there was so many different things that I think we do that you know some of our, our my kids don't get to do. You know, there aren't, there aren't any kids playing in the cul-de-sac or like that anymore. Everybody, you know, it's a digital age right now. One hundred percent. To that point. To that point. I used to work in childcare, and I would year after year just being outside, whether we playing dodgeball or whatever we doing outside with the kids. It would amaze me, bro, how like uncoordinated <laughs> the kids are, bro. And I, and, I, and I don't mean like can throw a tight spiral or like know how to flick their wrist on a jump shot. I mean just running and jumping. Just regular just, patterns. Just, yeah. And I'm like, you could tell these kids is inside on video games all day, bro. And that's, you know, that's the, that's the tough part, right, is, is as a parent trying to balance that because they don't know what they don't know and, and so if they don't get the opportunity to be to be outside and, and to kind of experience that why would they know I mean, there's so much you know there's so many different things that can distract them or, or grab their attention now that you kind of have to like implement it now but for us we didn't have we also didn't have the, the things they have right we couldn't there was no phone to just hang out and and, and you know zone out on 
throughout the day. You, you had to go outside in order to entertain yourself. And so, you know, as a result of that, I think some of that coordination part that you talk about was just kind of naturally happened. Whereas now, you know, there's so much, you know, specializing in a sport or not doing it at all that you kind of miss out on some of that stuff a little bit for sure how did you now now you said of baseball was like primarily your your, the sport that you played in an organized fashion um was there did you have to find with, with your dad being who he was did you have to find the balance between like playing all the time or like him wanting you to play all the time or you wanting to play all the time or like what was that my dad was uh my dad was like, when it came to baseball, he was he was really hands off. Like he allowed me to figure out if I liked the sport on my own, you know. And and I think because of that, eventually I it was easy. It was an easy it was an easy love. It was an easy sport to to fall in love with um, because I was never forced. I, I was around it. I, I was blessed to to be up to be able to grow up kind of in that clubhouse. You know, no matter what the year was, no matter who the ro- who was on the roster, because my dad was here every year, I got a chance to experience that. So, you know, I didn't necessarily have to play it a lot because I was I was around it. I was I was absorbing it, even when I didn't know I was absorbing it. I was I was just in it. And so, eventually, baseball for a while wasn't my love. Basketball was, and um, you know, as that kind of grew, baseball. I worked on it less, but I still was around it like most of the, most of my most of the time. So um, it was interesting. I, baseball was always there, but it wasn't my first love. Got you. That makes a lot of sense. Um, my now I'm from now we spoke about it on the phone a little bit. I'm I'm originally from Long Beach as well. Ironically enough, my dad and uncle went to high school with your dad and uncle. Yeah. And when we first got here to San Diego, shout out to Long Beach Poly, shout out to my uncle Clarence, my oh, dad yeah. Stefan. Um, <laughs> When we first got here to San Diego, and of course, you know, your dad is who he, who he is, my dad, like, told me early, I was maybe, like, seven, he was like, now, you know, both he and his brother, Chris, were really good basketball players. I was like, no way. He's like, oh, he was like, they might have been better at basketball. And he was like, probably not now. He was like, but in high school, they may have been better at basketball than they were at baseball. They, uh, both my uncle Chris and my dad, that was, that was their first love. <laughs> Certainly, it was my dad's first love. Um, and, you know... You know, as having some parents from Poly, that's like a very, um, there's a lot of pride when they, t- when they talk about Long Beach Poly. And my gener- my, myself, my sister, my cousins was the first generation of Gwens or Curitans that didn't go to Long Beach Poly. Everybody else did. And so, you know, they held that over our head for, for quite a long time. But, um, yeah, they, they, basketball was a, a sport that was very much... If you didn't know that my dad played baseball and you were just hanging around the house, you would have thought this dude, that's all he, he, he was a basketball guy. Like he okay. loved hoop, loved hoop. So uh, I think I did develop a love for hoop, the Lakers, a disdain for the Celtics at a very, very early age. Same, bro. That exact <laughs> same story. That exact same story. And it's funny, my dad, he, he's, born, he's born in uh, Muskegon, Michigan. And he, and you know, he's got five, four, seven, he's the oldest of five. But he, my, my grandma and my dad and all his siblings, they moved to Long Beach. My dad was like 12 or 13. And he's just, it's Long Beach everything. Like we've, we've gone back to Detroit a couple times, but it's Long Beach everything. And to, to that pride, bro, like growing up, just listening to my dad and my uncle Clarence talk about how much winning in football they did and in track and everything, it made it where... I mean, my dad was at all my games anyway, and my uncle Clarence was like my everything growing up. He still is, um, but like, so like, if I lost or didn't win a championship or didn't break someone's record, I almost didn't want to tell those stories when I came around, bro, because they didn't have no stories about losing nah, ever. Not a, not a, it was Long Beach Poly. We dominated. Ironically, uh, I have an uncle Clarence wow. that is that is I'm extremely close to. Wow. Play football at Long Beach, and growing up, you know, he was much closer to my age uh because he was the youngest of you know of eight kids um on my mom's side and so you know i used to hear stories about their long beach poly teams like that he was on and and it was consistent so no matter what story i didn't play football but if i went to you know let's say a poway game he didn't want to hear nothing about 
what Powell did, because, you know, in, in their eyes, it wasn't even on the same level, right? And it probably wasn't, <laughs> considered, considered some of the NFL guys that have come out of Long Beach Poly. But, uh, yeah, man, it's, uh, it, it's, it's funny that, you know, if you know somebody from Long Beach or, or you have some family from Long Beach, you definitely are going to hear about it if they went to Poly. Mm-hmm. There's, just, there's just no way of getting around it's it. Like- I was thinking about my uncle and Poly, and then we'll move on. To your point about like, you know, the like oh, it's power, they probably ain't. <laughs> when I never forget, but I, I ran track up until like like eighth grade, maybe ninth grade. When I was in fifth grade, I went to Valencia Park in Southeast, and the mile time, maybe our PE coach was gassing us, just getting us motivated, but he told us the mile time was like eight thirty or something like that, right? And me, and I'm in fifth grade and I got me and like three of my friends, we're like the fastest kids in school. We breaking like the every week, every week at recess, we all we do is run and right, play basketball. Right, That's right. it. Run and play basketball. He tells us the mile time is like eight thirty five or something and we're all in the same class and we decide like oh we can we can beat that. But we decide like we go run but we go all cross the finish line together. Just like being being homies. We think it's dope we all be in a record book together, right? Yeah. So we do that. We all like slow down, cross the line together, right? And all I care is I broke a record. So I get to go to the, to the family and tell my Uncle Clarence that I broke a record. You know what I'm saying? I get to, I'm like, yeah, uh. Like, yeah, well, yeah, so yeah, so I broke. He's like, oh, he give me a daff, right? I'm like, yeah, so me, my homie Eldrick, da da da, we all broke. He's like, hold on. Y'all all broke. <laughs> He's like, how y'all all break a record together? I'm like, nah, well, you told us the record and we all slowed down so we could cross the line together. He's like, why you didn't speed up and cross the line before then? He's like, who, he was like, who be in a record book with other people? And like, let go of the dap. It was like, you ain't, you ain't <laughs> took, it, no took it back. Yeah, took his dap back. He was like, you ain't got no record, man. Yeah, so yeah, they, they don't play over there in Long Beach Valley. They don't. There was, uh, it was, and you know, in some ways it was really good for me growing up. Like, there was a, there was a level, there was a standard that, that had to be met. And, you know, if you didn't, you didn't reach it, don't expect any, you know, any praise coming your way. It, it's just the standard's the standard. <laughs> I hear you. So uh, what, um, well, you said there was no travel ball back then. So what, you were just, just Little League Baseball up until high school? Little League Baseball, um, you know, yeah, pretty much to high school. I, you know, for, for myself growing up, pretty much until I went, until I got to eighth grade, I was going back and forth between private schools. I think it was at Parker for a little bit. And then when eighth grade came, I tried to convince my mom, my sister and I, for a long time, we wanted to go to public school. We wanted to go. To, we didn't really want to keep getting up early and driving way out here when we could just, you know, go to the, the school that was close. And we finally convinced her in eighth grade that, um, that we wanted to, to go to a public school. So we went to Twin Peaks, which was down the street from the house. And um, that was really the first time that I started getting into hoop on a organized level you know you're playing for your eighth grade team and you know at that age you start to you know there's going to be different club teams that start to filter into these high schools and so now you're starting to be exposed to you know a little bit more you know prior to that it was just you know the little league or being at the stadium with my dad outside of that I really didn't I wasn't exposed to a lot in terms of sports I played you know I played your your local soccer stuff when I was younger at that point but once I got to like eighth grade then it started to become a little a little more serious got you got you what did with a freshman year with were you straight to varsity how what was your career no, like in high school so, um in high school I played freshman my freshman year I struggled in school academically okay. and so you know Figuring out that you know you gotta have at least a two point to to participate, mm-hmm. that was that was an eye opener for me. My what was the reason for the struggle? Um, I just didn't do well in, in school. I, I, I had a hard time comprehending things at time, and you know, quite frankly, some of it was just being lazy, just not mm-hmm. not dialed in, not really understanding the level, the effort level it was going to take to you know to 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 thrive in in high school, right? And so, um, just my priorities were just, you know, young, 14, you walk on a high school campus, there's all kinds of things that, you know, you're being exposed to that, you know, maybe you had before, and uh, you're just trying to figure it out. And it took me, it took me a little bit of time to, to figure it out, but eventually I did. So I played freshman my freshman year, both baseball and basketball. My sophomore year, though, uh, I was able to make varsity. And... Uh, it, you know, at that point, 
you know, you, you, you're starting to see that there's there's a big difference. You know, I, at, at that time at Power, we had a we had a, like a, a a real like college sized team. We had a seven footer. We had two guys who you know six seven six eight on the wings. We had you know so we had like a a, a real team, and uh, we ended up losing the Helix that year, and in, um, in the semifinals. Um, and you know they would they would go on to lose the lose the Ranch Bernard on the finals, who we had beat three times that year. Um, but it was that was kind of the start of of serious sports for me. Mm-hmm. I hear you. What um at, at what point did you realize? That, that you could probably play college. And then when did the, did the recruitment letters, how, how did your recruitment go? So in, in, in baseball, I'm curious about that too. Because Cause I know you were drafted I, out of high school, but still went to college. Yeah, so baseball was, was, was interesting because as I said, it, ba- basketball became my first love. Mm-hmm. And then once, the, once it's, I was a, didn't play varsity until I was a junior in baseball. And um, I was kind of just playing, like, I remember walking in before freshman tryouts um, that year for baseball. I was like, I don't really want to play, man. I, I just, I think I'd rather just lock in on basketball and, and do that year round. He was like, he kind of sat back, sat back in his, in his lazy boy and he just kind of looked at me. He's like, man, he said, you're going to be bored, man. You ain't going to have nothing to do. You know, because at that time, as much as I wanted to do basketball year round, it would have just been me. There wasn't like... AAU teams running around like that mm-hmm. at that point right. and uh, or it was just getting started at that point it hadn't grown to where it is now mm-hmm. um, he was like man you're gonna be bored man you, you just play just so that you got something to do you never know what can happen so I you know I took his word for it uh, I think how he sold me was he told me that his freshman year he went to his mom and said the same exact thing about just playing basketball and she was like, just keep playing, you, you, you know, you never know what can happen. So I took that as, as a sign and I was like, All right, I kept playing. But I didn't get on varsity until I was a junior and I had a good season. I got invited to what is known as area code games now that, you know, I didn't know nothing much about at the time. Um, and so f- I ended up making this area code team. I have about two months to prepare. Meanwhile, my dad is chasing 3,000 hits. So I'm at this point, this is the first time I think I ever like just focused in on working on baseball. Didn't do anything else. I traveled with him for that little span of time, getting ready for this area code game. I end up, he ends up getting 2,000. He is, he's 29.99. He's going to Montreal. I have to head back for these area code games. So I missed 3,000. Uh, you see the, the the video of my mom and my cousin and my grandmother. You don't see me. I'm I'm already back in San Diego at this point, getting ready for these area code games. So I watched it on TV. I watched. I, I see the hit. I head up to Long Beach, where the area code games are at Blair Field at the time, and uh, I had a great showcase. And I think that was the first time it became real that baseball might be the the the, the route I need to go. Because within weeks, I started getting a bunch of college letters. And I had never received a letter in basketball. So at this point, you know, the light starting to go off. Like, all right, this is, uh... and it was so many letters that it was like, it was like kind of a, it was like a, it was like a sign from God, honestly, that this is what you need to, it was that many letters that had just kind of flooded in all at once that really kind of turned my attention to baseball. Wow. And so at that point, it was hard, don't get me wrong, to, to let go of basketball, but you just had to have, I had to have an honest conversation with myself at that point, right? Like, here I am finishing my junior year, going into my senior year. I, I haven't had any letters. I haven't talked to any coaches. Like, I was good, but maybe I wasn't college good, you know? And as a, as a 16, 17, you know, that's a, that's a, a tough conversation to have with yourself, but it's necessary. So, um, all summer, I kind of had to have that conversation over and over with myself. So, by the time my senior year came around, I had come to grips with the fact that this is probably going to be my last competitive basketball season, and I was going, you know, put my focus to baseball. That's very interesting. I would have, you know, 
I assume, and I'm sure a lot of people, other people would assume, you know, being Tony Gwynn's son and him being who he is and you end up going pro, you would think like, oh, he probably was on the circuit and he played travel and he did all the stuff to get ready to go pro. And it just just kind of happened out of nowhere for you. It did. It did. I, I mean, you know, I'm a man of faith and, and I believe that, you know, there are signs that you get that you got to be paying close attention to. And as much as I love basketball, it was clear, it was, it was evident that that wasn't the route I needed to go. Now, there were some opportunities later when I got to San Diego State to walk on, but I also knew myself, you know. I, I knew what I could handle, what was going to be too much. And um, I, I decided to just, you know, lock in on baseball at that point. I hear you. I hear you. Heather, can you make sure that Tony's camera's still going? Now, um, all the letters start coming in. At the this is prior to your senior year, right? Yeah. What what kind of how what kind of season did you have your senior year? I had a great season my senior year. It like I want to say like four forty something around there. Mm -hmm. um, all all league, all CIF. Um, it was it was it, it, and again you, these things just start to kind of to roll for you at that point. Um, I knew even you know going through that senior year having a good year, I knew I was going to college. I just I knew from my experience of watching my dad for so long and seeing those guys on a consistent basis and what it took, not only from a physical standpoint, but from a mental standpoint, I knew I just wasn't, I wasn't there. I, you know, moving out of my home and then like living on my own in a city that I just knew I wasn't, I wasn't capable of handling that at that point. Um, and so... This, even though it was, they offered me a, a, a nice price tag to, to play, it wasn't about that for me. I, I wanted to put myself in a position. You know, you get drafted, and that's cool. But for me, it wasn't about the money. It was about the number at the time, right? It was, I was the thousandth pick. I was the 33rd round. That wasn't, uh, that wasn't something I wanted to come out on. So at that point, once I got drafted, it didn't matter how much money they offered me, honestly. I was determined to move my draft stock up at that point. And so that became my little chip on my shoulder. I never, I didn't have one, didn't have a reason to have one up until that point. Mm -hmm. But that was the first time it was like, oh, okay. You don't think I'm good enough. So I'm, I'm gonna prove, prove you guys wrong. So oh, I love it, I love it. And so when you get to, you get to San Diego State, you get to San Diego State and what is, uh, are the facilities already named after your dad when you get there? The stadium is named after after my dad uh, when when I got there, and so you know that was uh, that was a little different playing <laughs> playing with your 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 name on the on the back of the mm -hmm. behind you for me in my case playing center field. Um, but it was it was uh, college. I mean, San Diego State was like I look back on that time. It's probably some of the best times of my life outside of having my family. Right, like you're learning you're still learning about yourself. Your first time you off on your own. You're having to make, you know, grown-up decisions. And uh, you're having to try to balance, you know, it's time management still, right? You, I'm not being forced to go to school no more, but, you know, you got to you gotta make good decisions when, you know, you, it's, uh, it's in your hands now. And uh, I just enjoy my I, I grew so much at San Diego State as, certainly as a baseball player, but uh, as, as, a, as a man, period, I think I... I grew a lot in that time frame. That's dope. That's dope. Now, playing playing high school and college, well, you, you said it sounds like college was all just wonderful times for you. But I, I'll, I'll ask anyway. Playing high school and college baseball, did you experience any like like I oh, mean, you just haircut man just because your dad is? Of course. Cool. I mean, I think uh, that is that's going to be the natural uh, go to for for haters mm -hmm. in general. But there's always going to be that kind of at least thought, even if it isn't actually said out loud like is he actually play right. is he here because um because it's what, it is, what his name is i i probably experienced that more in hoop than i did in baseball i think in baseball people just assumed that i was gonna be good mm -hmm. in basketball you know, no most people didn't have the the information that my dad was a hooper and and, and things of that nature but you know those are always uh, you can use that. You can always use that kind of stuff as fuel to mm -hmm. to get better. Mm -hmm. Now you you came out after your junior year uh, state. Yeah. yeah, after my junior year, I got drafted second round, second pick. Mm -hmm. um, 
And you're happy with that selection? I was definitely happy with that selection. I mean, I, I, I did what I wanted to do. Would I have loved to have been a first rounder just for to say I, I was? Mm-hmm. Yeah. But it's, it, there's the one thing I could hold over my dad's head was that I was, dra- <laughs> I was drafted a round earlier than him at baseball. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, no, I, I set out to accomplish that. I was able to do it. I got drafted to a, an organization that I knew I was going to have a, an opportunity to, to, to go through. And uh, I met some of my best friends in, in that time period. Uh, getting to, to know Prince Fielder, getting to know Ricky Weeks, um, two dudes I, I, I still talk to to this day heavy. And uh, again, you, 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 you know, it's, a, it's, all, it's all evolution, right? You, you're evolving through all these different periods of time. And, uh, yeah, you get, to, you know, the minor league experience, you, you, you know, you're trying to find your way. That's probably the first time I actually struggled in baseball, my first full season. You know, I, I signed in June. I was playing in July. Had a great half season. Hit 2A. Started in low A, which is relatively high for somebody just signing and then in the next year they sent us all three of their you know higher prospects myself Prince Fielder Ricky Weeks sent us straight to double A which at the time wasn't something that happened very often it was you know you go low A you go high A you prove yourself there you go to double A but there was some concern because where our high A team was and you know Basically, it was changing guys' swings because the wind blows out in Lan- Lancaster, and uh, they didn't want us, you know, messing up our swings. There. So they sent us straight to Double A, and I struggled immensely. It was the first time I had ever um, been by myself. You know, when I signed that first season, I had a roommate. I was with I was rooming with Prince. My second year, I was by myself, and then you know, a game of baseball. Especially start getting to the double A, triple A level, you're usually going to have your your first little bit of struggle, and uh, for me it was it was tough. Like going home to those thoughts at night by myself. I'm in I'm in Huntsville, Alabama. I'm, I'm extremely far away from home, um, and you gotta you gotta find a way to get through it. And so as rough as that season was, it definitely gave me tougher skin it made me stronger mentally and uh from there it was i was able to navigate after that season a lot better um than i was that first season it was it, it puts it put some armor on me for sure i'm sure i bet now in in basketball i know that the g league is um and you used to hear a lot of guys tell like a lot of G League horror stories. Like they're like, I, I played there for a couple of years, and it was like, if I didn't make it back, if I didn't make it to the NBA, I'm going overseas. Is that is that is it similar to, to the minor leagues? It can be. I mean, the opportunity to go play outside of the United States in baseball isn't as easy as it is, and I shouldn't say easy. It's not as prevalent as it is in the other sports, right? Because there's really only a couple leagues that are, you know, that you can go there make some money and that they want to want to bring you on. I mean, because those leagues, you know, are, are pretty tough leagues, whether you're talking Mexico, whether you're talking Japan, Korea. Um, but outside of those really three leagues, um, there's some that, you know, have leagues during the winter, but nothing year round like that. And so, you know, it's it's a little bit different ball game. So but a lot of guys get to that point, though. I mean, minor league baseball can can break you. You know, you, you these bus. You're getting on these bus rides. You're going to these small towns. You know, and you you know you're doing it every day. And the schedule's a little different now. You know, they they've uh, found a way to compensate minor leaguers a little bit better than they were when uh, they got a union. Mm-hmm. Now it's a little bit different than it was when I was coming up. But uh, it, yeah, it's a grind. It's just, it's a grind being in by yourself. You know, staying in these. You know. Small hotels and uh, motels in some case. Uh, you just, you know, you're just you're chasing your dream at that point. And you got to be able to look beyond the kind of circumstance and just remember what you're getting a chance to do, which is play pro ball that so many people would love to do. That's, that's how I tried to, to keep myself centered and, and locked in on what I wanted to do. How long before you got called, called up? I was drafted in... in June of 06, I made it to the big, or excuse me, June of 03, 
I made it to big leagues in June of 06. So about two and a half seasons it took me to get up there. Yeah, yeah. And so, um, you know, my dad always used to say, it's, it's, easy to, it's easier to get up there, it's harder to stay. And so, you know, once you get up there, everything's happening so fast. You're trying to, you know, digest it all. Um, but, you know, you just, you just you try to take, you take your lumps when they come and you take your successes and you just try to stack them on top of each other, try to have more successes than you are uh, taking the lumps. Hey, what would you say is your, your, your high point there with the Braves? With the Brewers? Uh, I, I would say my high point was, uh, ironically, um, getting that hit off of Trevor Hoffman. <laughs> getting that hit off of Uncle Trev, man. He was, uh, you watched that dude grow up for so long. I was close to him. I am close to him. And uh, come up in that moment and get a big hit, although it was painful for him in, in the city of San Diego. Mm-hmm. It was a big moment for me. Uh, and it's, you know, it's one of those ones you don't, you don't forget. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I don't watch much baseball now, but as a kid, I watched it a lot. Well, I, don't, I really only watch basketball, and I don't watch much football either. For sure, be watching the Super Bowl, but I don't really. Anyway, um, but back then, I used to watch a lot of baseball, and I remember, I remember watching that with my dad. I remember watching that with my dad, like, I remember my dad thinking, like, oh, this is this. It's a moment here. This is it's a moment here. It's funny because it's not often in any sport or any time that you can like envision a moment happening. But as I sat on as I got the call to be the pinch hitter and I got on the on deck circle and I'm looking out there, those thoughts like literally ran through my head. Like this is kind of crazy. Like you, you like grew up watching this dude pitch and get a get some of the best hitters in, in in the league out like all the time you like been running football routes with him before games like for his condition and like you know this dude and you know the, the fact that I did know him was probably what allowed me to have some success I, I knew him really that well that and you know I paid it the one thing my dad was was pretty strict about there was a couple things when when I went to the field with him I had to respect the space because although it was a game to me, it was a it was a livelihood for the, the men in there. And the second part was pay attention. Don't talk. Just pay attention. And I I did that. I at least got that part accomplished, you know, was was I paid attention. And so I was in a good spot when I got in there to probably better than more than anybody else could have been in that building that day. That's so dope, man. I don't think that's like that's something like you write in a movie. Right? That, that's, it, it's, uh, I, I've been fortunate to, to have a few of those type of moments. I know my first big league hit came 22 years to the day that my dad got his first big league hit. Both doubles. Both doubles. That's crazy. And, uh, you know, I, I, like I said, I, I've been blessed to be a part of, to have moments like that that, that just stick. Mm-hmm. That's really cool, man. Actually, so you play, what was it? Two and a half, three seasons? With the Brewers? The Brewers before? Yeah, about two and a half, two and a half seasons. Um, going into, because in 2008 we made it to the playoffs. I got to have that experience. We ended up losing to the world champs that year, which was the Phillies. Um, and then the following year I came in, I was a little banged up. My shoulder was, was kind of jacked. I had to have, you know, get a quarter zone shot. That kind of just set my spring training back. We had a new manager. And so it didn't work out. So I ended, they, they ended up taking me off the roster. I'm down in AAA again. And, you know, again, you, you got you to gotta make a decision. I think I'm like 27 at this point. It's like, you going to pout about it or are you going to try to figure out a way to, to get back up there? And so after I stopped pouting about it, I, I went out and I did my thing. And I, I got traded. I got traded here, San Diego. And uh, that, was, that was a dope, that was a dope moment. Like, it's not often that your father is breaking the trade news to you. You know, usually that comes from a manager, manager or the GM. But they, I think Kevin Towers let let him call me and let break the news to me. So, what did what did he say? Um, I was at breakfast. Um, one of one of my homies who who's uh, in the Dodgers organization, Jason Bourgeois. He was uh, we were sitting there eating breakfast, and my phone rang, and it wasn't unusual for my dad to call me. You know, in the morning. Um, but he got on the phone and he asked me if I was sitting down. You know, that's not a question. That's not a, a question you typically like to hear. You know, at least in my mind at the time. Yeah, for sure. Um, but he was like, "You sitting down?" I was like, "Yeah, what's up?" And he was like, he just burst out like yelling, like 
You've been traded to the Padres, basically. And uh, I could hear the excitement in his voice. Meanwhile, you know, I'm scared that him telling me is in my mind. This is how my mind is working. It's somehow going to like mess up the trade. Like, because I haven't heard from anybody in Milwaukee's organization at this point. And so like my manager is maybe a couple tables down. And so like I'm trying to like figure out how to feel about this. And then I hear his phone ring. And so immediately my mind was like, oh, that's, they're calling to tell him. And so, you know, he picks up the phone. I, I'm like halfway listening to his conversation, also trying to talk to my dad eventually. I'm like, you know what, let me call you back then. Hang up the phone. He hangs up the phone maybe a few seconds later, and then he calls me over. And at that point, he tells me I've been traded to San Diego. And at this point, I, I'm, I'm trying to act surprised like I didn't know, because I, as I said, I don't, I don't know if this is going to mess up the trade. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and so from that point, I remember calling my wife. She was in Nashville at the time because that's who I was playing with, the AAA team. She got the two babies packed up. I was like, pack up everything. We just got traded home. And she, didn't, and she was so ready to go home. She didn't even ask any questions. She just hung up the phone, got the stuff packed up. She didn't say no more. They say less, right? <laughs> got on the plane. I, I landed probably at like 6.20. The game was at 7.05, I believe, so. When I, by the time I get my uni on, I get to stay there, I get my uni on, I get dressed. The game's like in the first inning, bottom of first inning. And, you know, that's, that's an awkward time. You know, typically you'd like as a, you know, meet your new teammates, walk in while everybody's still getting ready, but they're already in game mode. So, you know, I'm trying to be respectful because I know everybody's locked in. Plus, who knows, I might have to, I might have to get locked in myself here, regardless of whether I'm just showing up. So I go down, I meet Bud Black. Game goes on. I end up walking, scoring the game, winning, run that first game, and then from there, it was that 2009 season was my best season, and it was it was a blast, man. Being home, playing in front of the city, was just you know I couldn't. Have, I, I I it was I was in a perfect world at that point. That's another one of them script script right. type stories, man. You know, I I mean I remember when I got the call. One of the things my dad asked me was. Did I want to wear the, his number? I was like, no, I don't want to wear your number. At that time, I was in the mindset of I'm trying to carve out my own lane, but I also wasn't stupid. I was like, why? I, I, you earned that number being retired. I don't want to, you know, I, I, let's keep that retired. I'll, I'll take the number below. So I, I wore 18 that year. And uh, but yeah, it was uh, it was it was that first year was was a blast. We weren't we weren't very good. At least first half. Second half, I think, if I'm not mistaken, we had the best record in, in baseball the second half of the season. And that's how we knew in 2010 we were going to be better than everybody else was expecting. Got you. Got you. What's it like playing pro ball in your hometown? The good and the bad. Give it to me. Uh, it, it's, it's awesome, right? You get to sleep in your own bed. You know, you ain't got to worry about renting a place. You, you're in your own place. Um, everything's familiar. At the time, I was living in PB, so it was nice just to pull up in the garage, pull up on the street, you know, I can go to the liquor store, I can go get, I can just walk, you know, it was just a normal time for me, and you don't, most guys don't get that, you know, even when you're playing in your home city, very rarely are you playing in a city that you're actually from, you know, so that was a bonus for me. The difficult parts, I mean, I, I'm sure you can imagine is, you know, everybody wants to come to the game, and it's all because of, they love you, right, it's out of love, but it can become hectic. It can become uh, it can become heavy at times, and it's 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 all great when you're playing. When you're not playing well, now you're you're taking on all of that. And I experienced that the following season. You know, um, get off to a slow start. You're just not playing well. You know, then in August I find out my dad has cancer. So it was a lot going on that following season, and it was. Um, and I think I associate that. In a negative, that second season, more, probably more negatively than I did the first. But that was probably because, I think that's because my dad got got sick that year. Um, but all in all, it was, the good outweighs the bad, for sure. How was that, Um, you know, I'm sure it was difficult, but just, you know, talk to me about, I guess, how difficult it was, you know, seeing your dad get sick and being there for him during that. Yeah, it was, uh, it was tough. It, it, it broke me at times. Um, you know, because my dad was like, that was like my best, my best friend. And so, um, 
You know, when you look up, you look up to your dad, and and I think this goes for anybody. You you see a superhero, you know, and so cancer has a strange way of of chipping away at that that armor, and that realization was tough. You know, Dylan, you know, seeing him, you know, basically deteriorate over time, and uh, still try to keep that jovial attitude that he had. And seeing that light get dim was was tough. It was tough on all of us. It wasn't well, not just me. It was especially tough on my mom. It was tough on my sister. And you know, in some ways, not in some ways. I think he he definitely kept me away. So I was still playing at the time. So I had to be where I had to be. And I think he recognized that. He knew that if if I became too worried about it, he would that that he was afraid I would just I just hang it up. And he probably was right. Um, so he, I think he in, intentionally kept me in the dark or, you know, had the family keep me in the dark a little bit about, um, you know, I knew he was sick. I knew he was getting sicker, but I, I don't think I knew how, how deep it was until, until it happened, you know? So, uh, I probably made it like even, even more devastating to not know the severity of it. I mean, I, I, I don't, I don't want to get a twist. I had, I knew the severity of it, but. You just didn't was, have all the info I, they had. I was right. I wasn't there. And I think it was intentional. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I know it was intentional. And so um, it didn't, I don't know that it, it hurt anymore um, because I, I understood what what he was thinking and why he did what he did. Oh, so there was no like, uh, no like uh, anger or resentment no. to the family for not? Not at all. Okay. Not at all. I think they, they did, they, they did what they did to try to protect me and I don't believe that, um, and I understood what my dad was trying to do because ultimately, when I started to kind of figure it out on my own, I was like, "Hey, I'll, I'll come home now." I remember I was in Philadelphia. We were coming back from New York, going back home, and I was like, "I'll come home now." He's like, "Nah, man, you got a you got a family to take care of," and so. Um, when he said that to me, I, I, I knew I had I had to do what I had to do at that point. Uh, but you know, losing a, losing losing anybody, but especially you know your pops or your moms or whoever it may be that that's you know a parent, um, it's it's tough. It's, there's just there's there's no way to to really get around that. At mm-hmm. All. Mm-hmm. And you know, yeah, that was that was that was a tough time for sure. Yeah. It's my last thing on that. We can. I don't want to stay here too long. I didn't. I didn't. Um, I'm, I'm guessing just because I was a kid when it happened. And of course, like the whole city felt the gravity of that. But I think because I was a kid, I didn't really do much like research into how or why. I think for me, I was just like, oh, he got he got old and yeah, no, this is mean, what happened. I, I didn't know that it was like cancer and tobacco and all that. Up, literally up until like preparing for this interview, I didn't know that. Yeah, no. Uh, and now the doc, the, the folks will tell you that they you can't prove that it was the tobacco. But, okay. Um, I'm, I think we're all pretty confident that's where it came from. And, uh, yeah, I mean that's that's uh, those are those some of those things you look back on, and you know you can choose to be angry about you know the tobacco industry or, or whatnot and, and and any of that, and it's all valid. But you know that was uh, those things were put in to play, and you know unfortunately my dad was. Was the one who had to, was one of the ones that had to suffer from it. Mm-hmm. Hey, hey, man! Rest in peace to the goat, man. Absolutely, absolutely. Now you, uh, growing up in San Diego, getting to finally play for the for the Padres. Did you? How did you feel about going to the Dodgers? I had no feeling about going to the Dodgers. Okay. See. Okay. Lot, you know, ultimately, it's it's my livelihood, right? And mm-hmm. in that case, the Padres had. Uh, they had non-tendered me, you know, basically didn't offer me a contract. Okay. And so, you know, what am I supposed to do? Am I, is my loyalty to, to the city supposed to outweigh my, right, right, right. my, my means of life mm-hmm. in that case? And the answer is, the answer is absolutely not. And mm-hmm. it's funny, people used to ask my father all the time, like, how do you feel about him playing for the Giants? Are you kidding me? That's my son. I'm, I'm rooting for, I'm rooting for him, mm-hmm. you know, of course. Mm-hmm. Don't mean, uh, you know... I didn't play 20 years here. It just means I'm rooting for my son and his 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 success wherever he's at. Right. Um, but I, you know what? I, enjoy, though people ain't gonna want to hear this, but I enjoyed my time. 
playing for the Dodgers. It's a it's a great organization, um, and you know I got there the first year before Magic and that kind of ownership group came in, and it was it was the year they took over the following year. It was just it changed into something that. I don't know that many people could understand. Like when uh, a, a order, when a team is going through what they were going through in, in 2011, uh, I think the owner was McCord at the time, and the divorce was happening between him and his wife. Like there's just operations basically stop as you try to as they try to divvy up who's getting what. And mm -hmm. so the following year, where the new ownership group came in, it was like, I mean, anything you could think of that is associated with magic started happening I mean it, and since then they you know they they've been who they've been at that point mm -hmm. but um, I enjoy my time there I, you get to play for an organization that is uh, as historic as as the Dodgers you know getting to hang around like some of the, the greats uh, that have ever done it you know I mean it's I, it's uh, I got to play with some unbelievably talented dudes Clayton Kershaw, Matt Kemp. Uh, I mean, I got it. And they gave me an opportunity, ultimately. After I had that tough year in 2010, I was able to go there, kind of get my foot, get my feet planted again and have some more good seasons after that. And uh, I enjoyed my time. I ended up spending longer time there than I did here in San Diego, mm -hmm. unfortunately. So, mm -hmm. and you know, that part of the, the not staying in San Diego was timing. You know, I came here under a different regime, new ownership, it, you know, this, those type of things happen when mm -hmm. um, you have turnover like that. Mm -hmm. Now with you having, you know, your, your roots in Long Beach, what, did you deal with a lot of like the same stuff being playing for the, for the Padres as you did playing for the Dodgers, like with family being around wanting tickets, coming to games? Not stuff? as much, but um, it was a little different. I, I, was, I was more established at that point by the time I got to LA and, um, you know, I didn't have as much I didn't have as many fan friends in LA that, that makes sense. in San Diego. Mm -hmm. More probably more family in, in uh, yeah, yeah. And LA, you know, Long Beach, LA ain't that ain't all that close, especially yeah. when you're dealing with tra mm -hmm. traffic. So a lot of people don't realize everybody that. ain't wasn't willing to mm -hmm. you know, get the car and drive <laughs> down there anyway. So, I um, yeah, man, it's uh, I had I, I didn't have it as much, I would say, and I didn't feel the same type of pressure that I felt playing here than I did in LA. It was just different for me. I'm sure. I mean, for most people, LA would be the more pressure packed spot, but after coming out of 2010, it was kind of a relief for me at that point. That makes sense. So um, I enjoyed my time there. Mm -hmm. You know, the, that will forever have, Long Beach will forever have, you know, I'll forever have roots there no matter what. Same. You know, you know what, and I've said it on the podcast a few times. I moved, my family moved from Long Beach to, to Southeast in 93. I was like five or six. And up until really, bro, up until like 2018, I always said I'm from Long Beach. I've <laughs> always really? said that, bro, always. It wasn't until, it wasn't until I started like doing more stuff around the city and I told somebody, I was like, yeah, I was like, where are you from? I was like, well, originally I'm from Long Beach. It was like, like somebody told me you went to Valencia Park. I was like, yeah, I went to Valencia Park and O'Farrell. He's like, bro, you not from Long Beach, bro. He's like, when did you? He was like, when did you get to Valencia Park? I was like, I'm in kindergarten through. He's like, kindergarten through fifth grade. He's like, bro, you yeah, from Southeast, bro. Dangle, man. It's, <laughs> yeah. funny because, it's funny because you know, I was telling you guys, my my parents moved down here, and when you are a, a young in the '80s, a young black family, you naturally are going to kind of close quarters a little bit until you start to feel comfortable mm -hmm. in your surroundings. And mm -hmm. so because of that, I didn't have a, a ton. I had a few friends at the schools I went to in the neighborhood I lived, but for the most part, it was cousins, it was uncles, it was aunts, it was my mom's side, it was my dad's side. Mm -hmm. Until I got to eighth grade and I started going to public school is when you first, when you first start to venture out at least for me as a kid. And then once I started playing hoop, and then I started playing in the AAU circuit a little bit, that's when I started to meet some of the homies down south. Got you. That's when it started to kind of, uh, I started to kind of branch out a little bit. Mm -hmm. You know, you start playing against these cats, and now you're seeing them in the summer playing. And so at that point, you start to develop some relationships. But prior to that, it was pretty, it was, 
it was kind of close quarters, you know, until my mom and dad felt comfortable. Uh, you know, they were very protective. Uh, we didn't really do a lot uh, outside of the family. Mm -hmm. My family was the same way. My mine more so comes with my dad is a minister, and so like they were like my parents were not very big at all and it's like hanging out at other people's houses yeah, they, sure. they welcomed everybody to our house anybody 100%. could come and anybody could stay the night well not no girls but you know anybody could stay the night but they were like nah you're not you're not going to nobody's it. house yeah, though. No, nah. my mom was I, I don't know that i got to spend the night over anybody's house if you had to come you had to first of all my my mom pops they didn't play any of that so i had to they had to meet whoever family it was that i was just going to go over to the same house. same and the same thing but when anybody was everybody was welcome at my house and typically everybody was at my house mm -hmm. but same experience like, bro I, re I remember <laughs> one of my one of my best friends and from like second grade through fifth grade my boy eldrick he still i think he still lives here in san diego but every year for his birthday he would have a a party and all the all the boys would stay tonight and every year bro from third grade third and fourth grade my mom was like, nah, you can't, like, no, I'm sorry, second grade, and then gotta come home. yeah, but, but it's, it, I was like, everybody's staying the night, though, that's when, like, the fun happens, when all, like, right. you know what I'm saying, this, right. the, when the night, that's when the fun happens, they finally let me stay the night, bro, you know, my parents made me pack my church clothes and picked me up, <laughs> picked me up Sunday morning, bro, um, like, no, you coming to church, yeah, yeah, oh, for sure. <laughs> just because you got to go over, it don't mean you ain't going to the my mom, uh, the only thing that would save me from having to take the trip up to Long Beach to go to church was my dad. I got if if he was like, oh, I'll take him with me to the stadium today. That was the only chance I had. I was still going up to Long Beach for church for a long time. Wow, long time. That probably stopped when I was maybe nine, because that was the first time. That was about the age my dad would consistently take me. So when Sunday came around, you know, at nine, I was like, I want, I want to go. Pops, can I go with you? Right, right. Then you know. They are, they're only home 81 games, so, you know, the other 81, they on the road, so some of them Sundays, it didn't matter. I was taking that trip up to Long Beach to go to, <laughs> to go to church, but, yeah, man, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's interesting that mm -hmm. you kind of have similar background. Very similar, because I was, I was going to say, I mean, not, not all the way. No, we weren't. I don't think we were still driving up to Long Beach for church, but when, um, when my, we were living in Southeast still, and my dad started pastoring a church in San Marcos. And I, had, I think after, after we moved to San Marcos, we would still sometimes come down to Southeast for church sometimes, just say, go, do church with like our old, our old church family. So yeah, we, we did a little bit of that too until my, like, I think my mom was finally like, all right, it's been enough of this. So <laughs> we got our church up here, like it's been enough of this, you know what I'm saying? Right. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, but, um, was there was there any significant thing or was it just time that that told you it was time to time to retire start looking for something else it was a little bit of both you know again i paid attention to, to, to <laughs> a lot of my dad's teammates and i watched guys come and go and i watched guys struggle with figuring out what they wanted to do after they were done <laughs> and so you know i was determined that that wasn't that wasn't going to be me so i would say like my Second year in LA, I started kind of trying to figure out what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. um, I may, I, I, it's about you know, it's about networking. I, I took advantage of my my time in the big leagues. I I, I always treated people well, um, and you know when you when you when you do that type of stuff, it, it starts to kind of build on its own. You know, so when I did get out of the game, and I was you know looking for something to do. I didn't know it was going to be uh, a radio host. I didn't. I knew I loved, I loved sports. I knew I loved talking sports. I specifically knew I knew a lot about baseball. Um, and I could hold my own in, in at least football, basketball. And so, you know, from there, it just, it just happened. Like, I started my first year out of the game. I, I worked for the Dodgers. I did their uh, pre and post every day on the radio. And you, you start to learn a little bit about the radio world, right? Mm -hmm. You start to learn a little bit about sponsors. Funny story, I remember <laughs> I remember being on the radio with Dave Essay, who was one of my dear friends, works for the Dodgers on the broadcast side. We're doing uh, we're doing the show. It's his show, I'm 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 his co host. And it's the first time I, I learned that advertisers, you know, you gotta be careful how you speak on them. 
It was. I think it was like a, an advertisement about McDonald's, and I must have just like you and I would be sitting at the house like, yeah, like that don't even sound <laughs> right. <laughs> we go to commercial. We go, hey man, you can't be doing that, man. That's that's an advertiser. You can't be dogging them like that. I was like, oh, and he I didn't even think about it. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. But that was like my first like, you know, oh, uh oh, moment that yeah, I had yeah. that mm-hmm. I, doing doing radio, but. Uh, I did that the first year. I did like 145 games. I'd show up. Um, sometimes I'd go up to L.A. A lot of times I'd be in the studio here off of Arrow, off of Arrow Drive, and you know I'd be there until like midnight, just doing the doing the post game show, mm-hmm. taking calls. Learn. You start to learn the different fan bases. You know, L.A. is a as a as a fan base. They don't want you sugarcoating it. Like, if somebody is bad, they want to hear you say it. Mm-hmm. And they don't want to hear nothing about you trying to, you know, massage it in there. And so, you know, you start to kind of learn the different base, the fan bases, what they want to hear, you know. And so I took that experience. And uh, it's funny. It was interesting. I, I was I was at a soccer tournament that off season with my daughter. Or with my, yeah, with my daughter at the time. And someone had hit me up on on Twitter, and I, you know, I'm not on there a lot, but I happened to see it, and I felt some type of way about his questions, like, well, why are you working with the Dodgers? And I just, you know, flippantly responded, I, they gave me a job, and you know, why aren't you, why aren't you in San Diego? I said something along the lines, you got to ask them. And like maybe two days later, I get a call, my agent calls me, he's like, hey man, I don't know what you did, but. Uh, Padres uh, called. They want to. They want to talk, and so that's how I got back down here. That's yeah. dope. Yeah. Shout out to the Padres yeah. for that. That's <laughs> right? dope. Right. Uh, They're like, nah, we need him here. <laughs> that's dope. That's dope. Uh, and so, you know, it's 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 fun being home, man. It's mm-hmm. fun mm-hmm. not only being home, but being able to cover the team I grew up watching. Mm-hmm. You know, it's been fun to see them have some success. Mm-hmm. It didn't go that great last year, but you know, going to the my, in my first season, or my second season as a as a broadcaster, I get to go to an NLCS to and experience all that. It was it was uh, it's been a, it's been a been a cool ride, man. That's dope. That's dope. What's the uh, a, a lot of people? I mean, obviously, because you know you wouldn't know because you haven't done it. I don't want to make it sound like that, but like you don't you don't know some things until you do it. Doing you know broadcasting and radio is so much fun, bro. Oh, like my first time trying when the dude when the dude invited me, I was telling you off camera how I got started. When the dude invited me to just do, I was like, I mean, I guess because I reached out to him, I saw his content online, and I'm a cameraman, so I was, his content was a little a little iffy. I was like, I can make that better for you, bro. And he went through my Instagram and my YouTube, and he invited me to do the the red the sports segment on his show. And I was kind of nervous. I was really nervous when I did oh, the yeah. first one. For sure. And I sat down and I did it. And once I realized that it was like like yeah like potentially thousands of people are listening and will be listening but in the room you're just talking you're just having a conversation right. and that's the trick and that was the thing that that was the thing that really really helped me. people ask me that to this day like man you how'd you like you seem like so calm when you interview Norman Pell I'm sure when this comes out like yeah are you so so calm talking to people like this it's just it's just a conversation and, and you know I think that's the trick right is 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 removing your mind from the fact that there pro- there's could be hundreds of people listening to you right now mm-hmm. Listen to you flub that word, right? Mm-hmm. But <laughs> if you remove your mind from that and, and yeah. it's just a conversation, uh-huh. now like you're not worried about none of that. You're less likely to flub a word. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? It's just that's that was the thing that it took me a little bit to to understand, or or actually it didn't take me a little bit, which is why I think I had success early, is because I I removed that that thought of man, there could be. Mm-hmm. Hundreds of people listening to this right now. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I think you know. I was just. You know, I just had my mom on my other podcast. My parents on my other podcast. So, oh, thank you, man. I appreciate it. And I was talking to them about. Um, you know, I never thought about how like going to performing arts school and all the stuff I did as a kid probably prepared me for a lot of this because I don't. I don't really get nervous speaking to anyone. I don't really get nervous uh, speaking to crowds. Now, if it's like, um, you know. I've never had to do it. I could imagine I, I get nervous, like maybe speaking at a funeral or something like yeah, that. But yeah. like other than that, like I don't, you know. I I, I think this. I think the same way. Like, I, I it's a little different. I didn't go to a performing arts school, so it took me a little bit of time to to get used to, you know, that, whether if you're in a studio, that red light coming on, and it's like you 
you know, can't turn back now. Yeah. Like, you got to go. Mm-hmm. Um, or being on air and, and being okay with, like, dead air for a sec. Like, not mm-hmm. panicking when that kind of thing happens. Mm-hmm. Those are all, like, rep exper- experiences. And the more reps you get, the more comfortable you get with it. Now, you yourself, you've been doing it, you know, at former art school. That means you was exposed to this at an early age. And I, mm-hmm. I imagine that probably helps settle you. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Because, I mean, and I've, you know, I've told this story on the other podcast, but it was a... Uh, it was real, like, it was real cutthroat, that performer at Valencia Park in the 90s. It was, like, now, like, I could imagine. And I've heard, you know, I've seen, I've worked in elementary school, so I've seen kids that, like, they can't really remember lines and everything, but they'll, like, they'll make a tree costume unless you stand up there, and that's right. cool. Like, you get to participate. <laughs> right. Valencia Park wasn't like that. You had to audition in there front of the, no the two drama teachers sat there, and all, like, 150 kids that were also auditioning you had to go up there and recite your poem or your monologue and fully act it out in front of these hundreds of kids most of them you probably don't know and these two adults that you got to impress and you're nine years old yeah that's great <laughs> that's great see that's, yeah. that's at that age you know that'll that'll put that'll put some armor on you for absolutely sure. absolutely absolutely what's uh what's uh what's been your favorite part of working in radio and broadcasting just having a good time man it just you know, it's a, there's a certain responsibility that comes with, you know, having an open mic, you know, and in life, as we've seen over the last few years, there's going to be some things that, you know, ain't that comfortable to talk about that, that you got to address, yeah. you know, when, yeah. when, we, when we had all the, the social injustice issues going on, like, I had to get on the air and talk about that, and, you know, to an audience that may not necessarily understand, completely understand where I'm coming from, but you know, that's part of that responsibility that I think we have as as a radio host, as a, as a podcaster. There's, there's a certain responsibility that comes with it that I appreciate more now than I think I may have coming into it. And therefore, that makes all of the other conversations like so much fun Mm -hmm. like i i I enjoy just being able to rag one another on the on the radio for four hours you know we'll Mm -hmm. mix in some sports in there to talk about it right right a lot of it is just like we would be in the backyard you know with a beer just having fun talking shit Mm -hmm. you know i think that's uh i think that's that's the fun part for me i agree i agree actually uh I, i relate to that as far as like you know you know, you spoke about like having a responsibility to like speak to certain things on the mic. I don't know if you're familiar, but um, uh, two years ago I want to say, Orange Glen, Orange Glen High School, the, my high school, played a, a championship CIF championship basketball game at Coronado. I absolutely remember. And uh, I guess a former uh, alumni from there, he like brought some tortillas in and like threw them at the. I guess he said it was some type of celebration. Anyway, anyway, yeah, and it, it turned into like full like national news. Yeah. And me, you know, I'm not I'm not Hispanic, but that's that's my school. That's my alma mater. And you know, I got a lot of Hispanic friends, a lot of people that I love that are Hispanic, and I covered I covered basketball in this town. So I and I felt um, at first I was like I don't really want to I don't want to touch it because I don't want because I know once I put like speak my opinion and speak my piece, I can get going, and I can get kind of heated, and I don't want that to you know what I'm saying. So I was like maybe I should stay away from. It. But I was like you know like I gotta like I said I cover sports here. It's 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 my it's my job. Your job. It's my job to 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 cover and be a part of that. So, you know, I had uh, one of the assistant coaches from Orange Glen come on the show and he talked about, you know, that whole experience and everything. But I I did have that. At first, I was like, no, nah, I'm going to leave it alone because I'm already look like a homer because that's my school. But I had that. It was like, no, nah, I got a responsibility here. Yeah. And, you know, that, having that again, having that conversation with yourself mm-hmm. and, and kind of being able to process it. Right. Because it's, it's 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 naturally just not an instinctual thing for most people to do. Right. Mm-hmm. As you said, you 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 saw it. You calculate it, and initially you were like, "Eh, I don't know if I should if I should speak on it." But you had a little bit more time to kind of think about it, and you can get to a place where, all right, you know what? Yeah, no, I have responsibility. I'm comfortable with it. It is. I can do it in a respectful way, exactly, where, where I'm not offending anybody, mm-hmm. but still get my point across. Absolutely, my message across. absolutely. That's, that's an art in itself, being able to navigate that. Mm-hmm. It's not something that everybody can do or, do, or, do, or does well. Mm-hmm. I've been really, uh, got to get you out of here soon. I've been really trying to find a balance with that. Um, I feel like I've, I've found a pretty good balance with it as far as like, um, 
and I cover like high school sports and yeah. I, I work with a lot of kids and their parents, a lot of families, you know, here in the community. Um, so I'm cognizant of that, but I'm also an adult that is building a network that, that pop that speaks for a living that is going to share his life. So like on my other shows, like not on this one, but on my other shows, I might have a drink here. I might have conversations about things that maybe kids shouldn't be talking about. But, but again, like, but anyway, what I'm speaking to, like, I had to really, like, find that because for a lot, and I even, like, had the conversation with Heather about it. I was like, I don't, I don't know if I should really be sharing, like, my podcast stuff on this same page and all that. But I, I feel like I found a pretty good balance with it, though. I think, you know, especially for somebody like yourself who, who's done, I think we all, look, I, I have travel ball teams that I have. And, you know, you have to be mindful of that kind of thing. But it is, you got to find a balance, right? Because you are a, an up and coming artist in, in some ways, right? Where you trying to, you know, find your niche. Absolutely, well. absolutely. It may it may have started in the high school realm, but it may not end that way. Mm -hmm. And you know, I don't know that it's your job to to compartmentalize for everybody else. It's, you know, at some point, you got to be able to to be you who you are. Absolutely. And the, the the space that you provided. I mean, for high school for high school sports, especially on the basketball side, like. Ain't nobody else really doing it, so mm -hmm. you know. I think you know. I think you. I think you're in in that that sweet spot, like you said, man. You Thank you, man. A fantastic job. That's good to know. I appreciate that, man. I feel like I could sit here and talk to you all day, but I got to get you out of here, man. <laughs> I appreciate you pulling up on me, man. No problem, man. It was a lot appreciate of fun. You a lot of fun. I'm gonna have to have you on another show, man. We got a lot of stuff we yeah, could talk man. about. I'm gonna have to have you I'm, on another I'm, show. I'm open. I mean, season getting ready to start, so I ain't gonna have that much time. But next off season. Off, next off next season. Off season. You got me. I bet. I appreciate you, no man. No problem, brother. My guy, Tony Gwynn Jr. It's been another episode of On the Mic with Michael Flicks. I appreciate y'all tapping in, man. Until next time, take care.